Welcome to a morning edition of Elevate Your Grind, brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. I am your host, Todd Rosales, a little bit earlier than I usually am. Usually we do these at five o'clock, but as I told my guest today, this is a deload week for me. I have a little bit of free time, so I figured I'd come and spend some time with you all during the day. I know it's a nice surprise for those of you at work. You're looking at your Facebook when you should be working, and now you're seeing my pretty face. Um, hopefully you like it. Of course, stay tuned at 1230 today. We have the lab report. We'll go through the top five headlines in the news this week. Uh, try to do it in under 10, 15 minutes. Last week was a shit show. We had my daughter cameo on uh, because I had to watch her. So this one will be a little bit more professional, but probably not as fun. Um, I've been told by a lot of people that I spend too much time in the beginning talking about the things that are coming up. And guess what? I don't give a shit. Um, but next week we have my friends, David and Eric Ron on the 15th. That'll be live at five. And then on the 22nd, we've got a good friend of ours, Lawrence Horowitz from Entourage Effect Capital. Looking forward to those conversations. Of course, this week we dropped our interviews with Keegan Peterson, with Jeffrey Harris of Spring Big, and we had one more Case Mandel of Canadips. Those were all awesome conversations. Check those out at youtube.com slash elevate your grind. All right. Today's guest um, is another podcast host because I am not in competition with anyone. I think a rising tide floats all boats. I came across her podcast when I was doing my due diligence for Jeremy Jacobs. And I can tell you in my due diligence process, I try to find all of the pieces of information that I can, interviews, articles, some people it's easy for, some people it's hard for, but there's usually one or two pieces of content that I find, I think do a really good job of digging into someone's story. And then what I try to do is take that and dig in even further. Uh, the podcast that I found for Jeremy Jacobs was my guest today. So I dug into her a little bit. She is extremely impressive. She resides in Texas and I am extremely really interested in what's going on in Texas. We had a fun conversation about that as before we started recording. So I will actually go ahead and welcome her into the show right now. Please welcome the co-founder and CEO of Restart CBD, the host of To Be Blunt podcast, and a bunch of other things that we're going to figure out how she manages her time, Shada Tarabi. Shada, thanks for joining me. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. That was such a kind introduction. Thank you. Well, you know, I... Uh, I just sit here with a webcam and a microphone and I get to have all these accomplished people on the show. So I've got to make sure people know how accomplished they are. And like, you know, we can get into the reasons we did our podcast, but for me, I had a platform beforehand where I got to showcase my favorite companies in the cannabis industry and that went away. So when I didn't have that anymore, I came out with this and my goal is to show that it's not just a bunch of stoners and hippies in this industry, that it is some serious professionals and people like yourself with a marketing background that you can't take your traditional playbook and apply it to this industry. So you had that's to right. start from scratch and you're thriving again. So I love those stories and that's why I did it. Um, tell, us, tell us about your experience in the cannabis space so far and what brought you into the industry. If I read correctly, it was your sister, right? It was actually my mom. So my uh, mom is who I would say professionally introduced me into the possibility of working in cannabis in Texas. So I'll kind of back up a little bit prior to that. You mentioned marketing, uh, Austin, you know, I come from a corporate technology background, got my first job out of college with a, what I thought was a very fun technology startup, not super sexy. It was managed WordPress hosting. But so my background and expertise is really in platform, digital marketing. I love branding and full disclosure, even though I live in Texas, I do love cannabis. I love all of it. I love high THC. I love smoking it. I love eating it topically name it. I've tried it. And so that has been a part of my life for a really long time, probably the past like 10, 12, 15 years. I don't want to date myself, but a, a long time. It's been, you know, something that I've been a really big personal consumer of. Again, growing up in Texas, professionally working for a corporate company, there was no like conversation where it was, you know, oh, you could work in cannabis full time in Austin. Yeah. And, you know, or like you were even kind of alluding to as a marketer, there was no real Transa translation to like how I would do that again from Austin or really with my expertise. And so it was just this very weird, like, I love this plant, but I don't know how to work in this plant professionally. 
And so I love that I'm a marketer professionally and I'm a cannabis enthusiast personally. And then five, gosh, time flies, man, five, six years ago, I was actually in a car accident. So I was hit by vehicle as a pedestrian, fractured my pelvis in two places, was immobile for a month, um, went through a lot of physical therapy, steroid injections, um, pain prescription refills. And I think at that time, getting confronted with chronic pain was so shocking to me. You know, it's, it's like, obviously like as you, your body ages, like you experience like bumps and bruises and aches and pains. But I think I was like 25, 26 years old. And this idea of like, now I have been given chronic pain. How do you manage the pain? What does that yeah. look like for the rest of your life? And so that was a really critical experience that happened in my life. While it was unfortunate, it was a blessing because that's when my mother introduced me to the benefits of CBD as as a plant-based medicine. Now, you know, not to maybe right now in this particular conversation, get into CBD, THC, all those different ins and outs. But for me, again, reflecting on, I grew up smoking pot in the garage, hotboxing my car, you know, yeah. I knew, you know, maybe relative information around 420 or certain cannabis culture kind of activities, but I didn't understand what the hell the endocannabinoid system was. I really didn't know what CBD was. I had no idea what CBG, Delta A, I mean, getting into the real medicine and the real science and the, that application of the plant. And so for me, again, I really didn't understand the difference between hemp and, and, and cannabis and weed and marijuana. And so getting in the accident put me in a position of being in need of something different to help me manage that pain. And when my mom introduced me to CBD, because she knew that I was such a fan of high THC, she said, Hey, do you know what CBD is? Do you know what hemp is? And I was kind of like, you're freaking crazy, dude. I'm probably smoking so much. I'm getting enough of it. Not realizing again, kind of the science and how most marijuana doesn't really have a lot of CBD in it. If any, that's relevant or helpful. And so basically that was five years ago became personally a really big fan of CBD. There was no market for it. Uh, fast forward three years later, I ended up getting laid off from my job. I was director of marketing for a digital agency. Uh, nobody again wants to get laid off from their job, but I saw it as an opportunity to kind of open me up into what is next and what is next happened to be CBD. So my sister and I co-founded Restart CBD kind of right before Texas fully went uh, hemp legal. So it was federally legal in 2018 and Texas didn't go legal until June of 2019. And we launched that, in August ballsy. of 2018. It's very ballsy. I think we didn't, I don't really have a, you know, a gut check sometimes. I think I just <laughs> do things and like question it later. And again, because my parents were so like supportive, they were like, yeah, CBD, you like it, market, do some stuff. And it was a little scary. I mean, going from having benefits and a full-time job to being unemployed and to thinking like, how the hell am I going to survive? But my sister and I kind of put our heads together. We, again, with a background in marketing, branding, technology, I spun up a website. We were able to start kicking our brand into doing pop-up shops. We were one of the first CBD brands to open up locally. And now we're one of the longest standing. I mean, we've been in business for two years but that's, that's a long time in cannabis, especially cannabis in Texas, I think. So oh, there's yeah. a lot of stuff, but that's kind of how we got here. Accident, well, so big fan of the plant. And yeah, there's so many different tangents I want to go down. And that, that's my problem with doing these shows. But it's crazy to me how a lot of us kind of discovered it. And, and I'm going to say it this way. We discovered it as a drug and not a drug in, in the sense of everything else, but we discovered it as, right. as a way to disconnect or as a replacement for alcohol. And then the more and more you got into either this industry or into the plant itself, you discovered all the potential benefits that it can do for someone. I mean, I started smoking, I think 22, 23. I mean, I did in college here and there once a month, maybe once a week at most. But when I had a high stress job in sales, I couldn't sleep. And I started smoking cannabis to let's call it back then. I was smoking weed at the time. I was smoking weed when the guy told me I had X strains and everything else. I was just like the dude from grandma's boy where I'm like, dude, just, just give me a bag of weed. Like I don't yeah, care same. what it is. Fast forward. Now someone will hand me a joint or something like, Oh, where's this from? What strain is it? What's, what's the terpene profile? And they look at me like, just fucking smoke it, dude. Like, yeah. Um, so it's funny so relatable. We kind of, exactly. We all go on that journey. Actually funny story. 
I used to go out to Austin uh, once a month. I worked with a company called SHI out there. If you know them, they're off Mopac. And mm -hmm. I, I love Austin, Texas, one of the greatest cities in the country. Um, and I would go out there and my job was to entertain people from SHI because they were selling our services. Well, leading up to closing the deal, I was having people at happy hour and dinners and all that. And then all of a sudden we close the deal and they're, they're selling our stuff. And then all of a sudden I was like, Hey, who wants to go to happy hour? And they're like, Hey, we got kids and, and families and stuff. We're just going to go home. So here I am at four o'clock in Austin, Texas with no friends or anything else. And I'm like, man, really wish I can get some weed here. And I actually went all the way to Torchy's tacos off the UT campus. There was a head shop next door. And I just walked in. I'm like, go to the guy like, Hey man, how's it going? Oh, great products here and everything else. Uh, you know, I get some weed. He's like, what? I'm like, you know, I get some weed. He's like, you, you, you have to leave, sir. I'm like, oh, come on. I asked an Uber driver and everything else. Oof. So I'm just like, finally, I started allegedly bringing edibles with me to Texas. But, um, you know, it, it's, an, it's a great place, but it, it's funny, the history. So talk to me about, and I want to get back into your story, but talk to me about what's going on in Texas, right? Because Oof. you guys love your CBD and hemp. You've got CBD stores, you're fighting for smokable hemp and all this stuff. Is a lot of this argument just because there is no medical or recreational program on the horizon for Texas? Yeah. I mean, what a loaded question. It's something that to be honest is exhaustive to manage and maintain because when you start tracking it, it sounds a little crazy. When I say it all out loud, people are like, wait, what the fuck? I'm like, yep, this is my life every day and it changes. So yeah, we'll start at the top. Um, Texas's medical program is not as robust as I would love to see it be. Uh, for reference, federally, CBD can have up to 0.3% THC, and our medical program allows for up to 0.5%. There's only so many doctors who will write the prescription, and there's only so many ailments that it actually applies to. So it's a very, very limited program in terms of Texas opening up the medical program, which in my opinion is a necessary step before we see full adult use legalization. You would have to see them open up the, you know, the ailments, like the applications, like That's... what people could be using it for. I think there needs to be more doctors for it. So there's that kind of going on. And plus that, Texas that's is really a... interesting. So point, point 0.5. C... So basically you can <laughs> prescribe strong CBD or strong hemp is, is yes. what you guys are getting. Cause so when just, just a quick aside, when Florida did our medical marijuana program, I don't think there's a limit on the THC, but they didn't allow smokable flour. It was concentrates and everything else, which was to me dumb because you're allowing the most concentrated form of CBD or of THC. Right. Now in Texas, you guys are essentially allowing hemp and CBD to be prescribed. It's not even traditional cannabis at that point. I, don't quote me on this part. It's a little murky. I believe the medical is from weed. It's 0.5%, but it is from weed versus what I sell in my mm. store is derived from hemp. The THC percentage is just slightly bumped up. So it's not super sexy or appealing, in my opinion, for people to go out of their way to go through these hoops to get access to this other product where I, at a premium rate, right? And I think maybe the hitch is that people, um, medical, you know, maybe their insurance covers it. But other than that, essentially, I don't think that it's a very robust program. But I, I, I do love that Texas is super passionate about cannabis. Again, as a born and raised Austinite, I never thought that we would have such a boom for CBD. And because of my podcast, because I public speak in the cannabis hemp space a lot, I'm very fortunate to be very nationally connected. I'm very aware of what's happening in different markets. I think Texas is very interesting because I talk to people in other states where CBD isn't very big. So you were right. CBD is huge in Texas. And the fact that CBD is so huge to me is cracking a door super wide open for us to be more forward when it comes to, you know, all of cannabis. And so it's just very fascinating because yeah, we do have CBD stores on every corner and CBD is super hyper-focused. It's being incorporated in a lot of our restaurants and beverage programs and things like that. So it's everywhere. It, it's perfect though, because if you think about it, especially in Austin, you guys are very active. It's very outdoors culture, very yes. get out and do stuff. So CBD to me is a natural compliment, right? Where as in other places, it may not seem as good. It's almost to me like the CBD industry in Texas is 
like a proof of concept for what the cannabis industry can be. A hundred percent. I feel that completely. And so I think you do have a lot of shops right now, myself included, who are obviously very, I think people get into CBD because they see the end game of like full legalization. Right. And I wouldn't, you know, I don't want to pretend that I'm not somebody who would love to see that happen in Texas. Obviously, I don't know how that fits into my current business model. And again, given the timing, it's not something that I'm like, yes, in five years, there's a guaranteed plan where I can go get a license to operate a legal, you know, cannabis dispensary. However, I do think you're seeing, especially from a branding perspective, from a market perspective, from an education perspective, I think that's where we've really resonated and had so much success with our brand is introducing it. I mean, you paint a picture of Austin, Texas is still Texas. So yeah. there's a lot of different opinions depending on what, you know, outskirts of the country or the suburbs you're going to. But in Austin, we are super fortunate because we're this active city. People are curious about it. I love having a retail actually, because I get to talk to my customers in a very real time experience and just hearing their conversations and their sentiments around, you know, literally every end of the spectrum from I used to smoke pot and I haven't touched it because it's not legal here and I'm afraid and this is kind of the closest next thing and I heard it could help with x y or z and I'm curious to I've never touched the plant I'm so freaking scared what's it gonna do to me but I heard it could help I heard you guys are the experts let's go talk to the girls so we also um my sisters and I are the owners of our brand. We get, we're known by uh, this kind of name, the CBD sisters. So oh, that's nice. people like to come see us. We're very educated. Um, and we just care. Like, I just want people to have a good experience because I do look at it as a long game of, okay, if my customers can, not even just my customers, I don't care if you shop with me or not, like consume our content and get educated and always know that I'm not the smartest person in the room. I, I am probably one of the most educated people in the room, but I'm not the smartest. And I love kind of highlighting that because I encourage people to seek information. And I think that that's where this whole CBD conversation has been interesting, just contrasting it with my personal experience. I was so narrow-minded. I didn't really understand why smoking weed made me high. I didn't really understand why I felt relaxation or maybe why I felt in a better mood or de-stressed or had better sleep. I was just you know, kind of like you articulated it. Some people like to use alcohol. I personally don't consume a lot of alcohol, but I do enjoy mm -hmm. cannabis for those very same reasons. And so it wasn't until I really got into the, the medicinal side of CBD, but also just CBD in general, where it really opened up that whole dialogue. I mean, again, I think without CBD, you wouldn't even have in the marijuana space or the, the kind of full legal rec space this idea of these different cannabinoids and how the cannabinoids work together and talking about terpenes, like I'm really fascinated about those subjects. And I think that we're just scratching the surface. So I'm excited that we're, you know, eradicating these words like sativa, indica, and hybrid to relate to how something is supposed to make you feel. It's like, you said something earlier I wanted to kind of add on. I, I relate to, um, being in Texas, because I don't have dispensaries I can go to and be like, oh, she likes Bubba Kush or Durban Sour. <laughs> I'm just like, whatever the fuck I can get my hands on. Sorry if I should be cussing on the show. Whatever I can get my hands yeah. on. No one's going to cancel us. <laughs> Perfect. Love that. Whatever I can get my hands on, I'm not picky. Like, I just want to smoke pot, basically. Yeah. And now you're obviously getting into a market where I think people are like, oh, well, I want, especially from a CBD perspective, I see so much. Oh, well, I want the one that's really good. Like some guy literally came in yesterday. It was funny. He goes, okay, I need the strain that's really good for anxiety and also for appetite and also for sleep. And also sometimes I get stress in my mood. And was just like listing off all these things. And I was like, literally just pick anything and smoke it. Pick one, surprise yourself see what happens. Like, I can't tell you how it's going to make you feel, but obviously that's people want to be marketed to. And so I think that's where I, I exist in that middle ground of like, there's so much we need to learn about this plant. Let me educate you to like being on this journey. And it's, I joke, sometimes I'm a CBD Sherpa. I don't hike the mountain for you. You have to go on the mountain, but like, I can point out, Hey, here's some different products. Here's some different terpenes you should be considerate of. But then versus the person actually has to like try the product. So it's like, I now know maybe I used to not like edibles, to be honest, but now I, I like edibles because I've been playing around with ratios and I actually really do love a CBD split with some THC. I think it's a very um, nice balancing effect. And so it's just like, I wouldn't have known that had I not tried it. And so I always try to encourage people to be educated, um, do their homework. Ultimately it's your body. You should know what's going in it. And so just have, have fun with it also because- 
I do think cannabis is a, is a safe plant to explore. Well, I, you know, I, I, I gave you crap about the, the fake cannabis industry in Texas before, but, you know, the more and more I look at it, given where Texas is and the conservative nature of the state, I think it's really cool the approach that you guys are actually taking now because you have all these brick and mortar CBD stores, yours being one of them, that are a good first impression for the yes. cannabis industry, right? That's it. So like down here, you know, I always joke and I always say, I, I hate how quickly CBD blew up and that it's everywhere. It's in gas stations, it's in 7-Eleven, it's in all these places because I would hate for someone to be at a checkout counter at a gas station somewhere else and be like, oh, let me try this. And it's just a garbage product. Whereas 100%. in your state, people are coming to someone like you who is recognized nationally um, for your work and they're able to actually sit and talk with you and get an education on CBD. And after that, it kind of goes back to, for me, over-the-counter versus prescription, right? Where CBD is the over-the-counter version. And then if Texas, I, I, after you tell me about your medical program, I don't feel like I'm a big fan of it because where are you going to find those genetics that are going to give you the 0.5 THC? But if they would pass a, a true medical program, even they did the stupid thing that Florida did without smokable flour, that mm -hmm. you would have your over-the-counter where people can go and try. And it's like, hey, I tried the CBD. It doesn't work for me. It kind of did, but it didn't. And then someone can go get a nice ratioed product or a higher THC product and figure out what works for them. Um, I see that being a very nice, uh, like I said, initial introduction into the cannabis world. And maybe it would make an easier transition for Texas to go into full on cannabis. No, you're spot on. And I think that that's, I wouldn't say that's like a strategy that we're doing, but it's definitely like an approach that makes sense right now, given the landscape. I believe my job, my, 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 my purpose in life. I'm a very spiritual person. I believe, you know, we've all got put on this planet to do something. I really feel like God put me in Austin, Texas to be this person who's like, I love the plant. I'm somewhat educated. I'm giving myself not as much credit, but I'm educated and, and I want to help you understand. I want to help destigmatize it. I want to make my community as much as we are national. I want to help my community feel more comfortable with this plant because those people are the influencers. Those people yeah. are the voters. Those are the people who, again, as a marketer, I joke all the time and it's, it, it hurts my soul a little bit, but it's the reality. No matter how many campaigns I do, no matter how much marketing I do, no matter how many podcasts I go on, shows I speak at, when people come into my store, I ask them, how did you hear about us? And they go, I Googled you and you were the closest. They don't give a shit. Yeah. They, maybe reviews help. You know, they go, oh, I saw that you had a lot of reviews. Reviews help, obviously. When you come into my shop, that experience also helps. It's not like I'm selling, you know, cannabis in a back door somewhere. It's a nice, white, welcoming space, clean. Um, I think there's the subconscious stuff that, yes, we want people to feel comfortable because I would love for them to hopefully have a pleasant experience. But you're a little off in the sense that we have people selling in gas stations right now. We have people selling in doctor's office yeah. too. It is very scary. And right now to kind of bring it back around to Texas, Texas just issued a ban on smokable hemp for retail sale. So they issued it around, I think we heard about the notice to give you like a flash of the timeline, like let's say July 25th, it was enacted in effect August 2nd. So I had maybe a week to deal with smokables. Didn't, didn't um, they repeal it for like a short time to, to look at it? They didn't repeal it, but four companies are suing the state of Texas because they ah. amortize how much money they're going to lose. And so they be, the judge put a pause on the ban essentially until September 2nd. Then on <laughs> September 2nd, they came back and the judge said, well, we're going to, we're still in court. So we're going to now push, I think till September 14th. So in three days, I kept get the pleasure of deciding, hearing what the hell happens in the next step. So it's like, we're dealing with that at the same time that this ban happened, they also opened up, um, which I believe is a good step, this retailer license. So you have to get a license to retail. You have to get a license to manufacture. And there's some rules in there, you know, you need to have lab results. You need to, you know, do your testing. You need to put who your, your source of your product is. And I think those are things that consumers just don't realize it's so unregulated. It's unregulated at a federal level. It's unregulated at a state level. Unfortunately, people can sell it wherever the hell they want. People can put whatever the hell they want in the product. And unfortunately, a consumer can have a really shitty experience. And so that's why I preach not even just like education on quality brands, but like ask questions 
can you read the product label? How many milligrams are in the product? You know, does the product make you feel confident or does it make you feel questionable? I've seen some bottles people bring to my shop and say, I bought this at a smoke shop, but I don't think it's working. And I'm like, mm -hmm, let me read it for you. And you read it and you discover there's trace, trace amounts of CBD or no CBD or yeah. the difference between why it says hemp oil versus CBD oil. It's just people don't realize how much nuance goes into it. And so I get the privilege of, you know, sitting in the position of, of navigating it. And I love it because it's fun and fast paced, but um, yeah, Texas is definitely in an interesting position. And, and ultimately I'm not against this smokable ban. I think that's pretty shocking for people to hear me say, but ultimately I do see it as a step for us to get products um, into consumers' hands that is actually of quality. So if you can imagine a gas station is selling a pre-roll joint right now today, I don't know yeah. what the percentages are. I don't know what it's mixed with. I don't know how it's grown. That is really scary. So if I have to take a hit to not be able to sell smokables right now as our state figures it out, I do have good faith that Texas is pro, um, pro this plant, pro hemp at least, right? And so I think as we can open up hemp, open up the marketplace for hemp and plus CBD has so many other, I mean, not CBD, hemp has so many other uses. I'm really excited for the other parts of the industry to open up in Texas. So um, CBD is now, the way that I get to be in the industry, but I'm really fascinated about so many other aspects. Now I might be stereotyping, but I imagine as we look at the other aspects of hemp, that Texas is going to be a leader in that space when it comes to, to growing hemp for industrial use, when it comes to hemp plastics and hemp concrete and all these different hemp products. You know, like I said, I, I think I might be stereotyping because I think Texas and sometimes you don't think of Dallas or Austin, you think of these plains and farms and ranches and everything else like that. But I imagine that there should be a mass amount of appeal to the government in Texas, you know, you guys probably handle the coronavirus better than a lot of other places. It's, you know, but listen, I'm in Florida. We're a hotspot. So I can say that. Um, <laughs> if the only other place I can say it from would be New York, yeah, but right. I can, you know, everybody, everybody in the country, we're on the verge of a potential recession, depression, whatever it is. And people are looking for new ways of income. I can only imagine the government of Texas should look at hemp, at least from an industrial standpoint and think, they we should. could use that to come back. Is there any talks of, of the, you know, how is the industrial hemp market in Texas? Is there, is it starting to come around? I think it's up and coming. I think there's definitely, you know, noise for it and against it, not necessarily against it, but I just mean like, will it work? Won't it work? I think you have to think of the cycle of how some of those other aspects of the industry get set up. I mean, you can't just grow the hemp for, you know, hempcrete. You have to also be able to process it for hempcrete and the yeah. same processing that you would do for extraction for, let's say, you know, topicals or, or oils is going to be different than you would do to do some of these more industrial applications. And I just think people don't know enough about it either way. I heard some quote somewhere. I forget if it was at a Texas level, if it was at the national level, but it just kind of puts it in perspective for me too. I think when they were passing the hemp bill or when they are, you know, legalizing hemp, there was more of that industrial application. But I think this whole exploitation, uh, of cannabis through CBD has been really interesting because now you have this plant that from a Texas perspective, they were really only expecting like, oh, some farmers are going to grow it. They're going to turn it into this crop. They're going to make t-shirts out of it or paper. Cool. Now you have people who are like, I want to smoke it and I want to put it in oils and I want to you know, consume it and put it in my bodies. And, and the state's like, whoa, what the fuck? Now I have to regulate it further as a consumable because I have to think of the health and safety. And so when you look at the smokable and it's not, it's not by law that I cannot sell smokables or it's not by law that it's illegal. It's a regulatory ban that says, we just don't know what we're doing with it right now until we can figure that out. And so again, that's why I think I have some good faith, but going back to the industrial side, I just don't know if people know enough about it where they have those those necessary pillars to be set in place for them to go like, like, obviously I think everybody should be, you know, trying to source hemp paper 
It's more sustainable, yeah. but you look at who's making hemp paper. So if I'm a brand and I want to be making hemp business cards, I think there's maybe three brands right now. Maybe let's expand to seven. If people are getting into it on a national level, the price is really high. The demand is kind of in the middle. You just don't have people who are like right now, like let's go make hemp clothes. Let's go build hemp buildings. Well, it, and it's funny. I've been saying this and there's probably we've done 80 episodes and probably 50 of them. I've mentioned this, but I would love to see Starbucks. And I don't think you guys have this problem in Texas, these pain in the ass paper straws that disintegrate. I'm using one right here. You see, I'm drinking a coffee. It's from Wawa, this stupid paper straw because yeah. my county eliminated plastic straws. So we're going to kill more trees. Give me a hemp plastic straw. Let's start That's there great. because the paper straw sucks. No, that's right? great. That's a great application. I think you have to have some of those bigger corporations opening up the demand of like, hey, we need to supply X amount of whatever. Hemp's the main ingredient. Yeah. How do we, where, where, who, who's growing it? Who do we use? What does that look like? And so, yeah, I think Texas has the potential. I think that's the hype for Texas, but every other article I read is like, Texas was late to the game. They're just now getting in the hemp growing. And it's like, well, you know, and then you have a lot of farmers who saw a quick opportunity to turn it into smokables now, the smokable ban. So it's, it's weird. We're in as, the middle of As a of shop it. owner, how much of a, you know, were, was the smokable hemp really popular? Because outside of, so I, I consulted for a CBD company for a very short period of time, and they're talking about bringing smokables out pre-rolls. And now this company was focused on mixing CBD with other herbs and things like that. So it was very much wellness focused. And I looked at that and I'm like, if you're going to have a wellness focus, I don't think that a smokable product really fits into your portfolio because people who focus on wellness for the most part, unless it's cannabis or weed for that matter, aren't smoking things. They're not cigarette smokers. They're mostly probably not cigar smokers, maybe once in a while. So I go, now it's two sales. You have to sell them on using CBD and then you have to sell them on smoking it. But to me, I think there is a need. And they were telling me, oh, we brought them to South by Southwest and everybody loved them. I'm like, well, because they probably couldn't buy weed. So, I, you know, I, I, I'm curious to know because it seems to me that's with it. you, there is a wellness component to everything that you do. And that's where you're very interested in this. How, how, how successful were the smokable products versus everything else? And was it the traditional cannabis consumer that was pretty much buying those smokable products? Yeah, hell no. I mean, it was like all over the place. So when we first launched our brand, we were very wellness focused. I think we're still very wellness focused. To give you a little bit of insight into Restart CBD, my sister and I are the co-founders. We are also, I'm a marketer by profession, but my sister and I also, I'm going to use air quotes for people watching, influencers. We each have about 20,000 followers on Instagram. And so I used to be a food blogger and my sister is presently a fitness blogger. So she's a, a current food under blogger armor. in Austin. Is there a, a food better blogger job in, in the entire world? I've been like doing it for six for it. years. Like, it's amazing. Yeah. What's the only thing better than being a food blogger in Austin? Well, I could get into cannabis. So yes. there's literally one job and you just went for it. I just went for it. And so I always like to mention this though, because my sister is the epitome. She's a former University of Texas collegiate swimmer, current Under Armour sponsored athlete, gives a total Very shit cool. about what she puts in her body. I, on the other hand, ate ate like crazy prior to the accident. The accident for me actually was where I shifted into more um more wellness, just more recovery for myself. And so our brand is very much the blend of that. We launched again, not really for the me's of the world who <laughs> full credit, you know, would just buy weed from whoever because she likes the recreational aspect of the plant. Um, but my sister really was like, I don't want to put crap in my body. I want to know what the ingredients are. I want to make sure that it's high quality. And so when we launched our brand, it was very much like understand your ingredients. We don't put any bullshit in our products. We don't use any fillers, preservatives, flavors, colorings. Like it's very high quality, very pure, very effective. And so when we started creeping open the door to incorporate smokables, the side tangent is while I'm into fitness and wellness, I do smoke because I've been a cannabis yeah. consumer. I, I think I shocked my followers when I started posting more cannabis content on my Instagram because they were like, you work out six days away. And this is still a true story. I woke up, I woke up this morning, I worked out at 6 a.m. And then, you know, I went and hit hit my vape pen, my CBD pen. Like I just enjoy consuming. I don't see it as, oh, you're healthy. You can't also be smoking. I also know smoking is the most bioavailable way to experience cannabis. 
What were you going to say? So it, 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 no, it's, it's interesting that you say that too. So I, since I've had my kid, I haven't gotten back to working out consistently, but I can tell you, it's funny. I always looked at people who that I had friends who would smoke cannabis and then go work out. And I never understood it because a lot of times I would try that, but I can tell you there are certain days where, you know, you have that mental block. It's like, I don't want to work out. I just can't bring myself to do it. And there are times where I'll take a hit of, of cannabis or a vape pen or something. And as soon as I do that, like my mindset changes and it's like, I'm like, I, I like feel myself lifting the weight. And I'm like, okay, I got to go. I'm going to go hit the gym now. And it yes. actually gets me there when you think like, so we look at this stereotype of the lazy stoner and it's yes. like, no, I was being lazy. I had a mental block and just this one hit. And, and usually it is something sativa focused, right? Or at least what we think is sativa focused. Right. And it's like, boom, I can't get to the gym fast enough and I can't wait to work out. So it's funny that you're like, yeah, my followers are probably surprised because I worked out six days a week. Sometimes I think you need it to break that mental block because working out six days a week is hard. Well, or what's the difference of like, I can work out six days a week and be the epitome of health, but go enjoy happy hour with my girlfriends. Like that's okay. That's appropriate. But me yeah. who wants to go enjoy cannabis in lieu of, again, I eat a very clean diet. I practice a paleo diet, you know, 80, 20%. I don't consume dairy. I try not to eat refined processed sugars and foods, but I like to smoke cannabis, like sue me. And so I think that for us as a brand even has been such a fun conversation to hit because like I'll get on Instagram and I'll be smoking out of a bong. You know, we work with Grav. Grav is a nationally known, um, love those guys. Dave Daly brand. was on the show. Dave's amazing. So they're an Austin brand. So they're in our backyard. Um, we love partnering with them. We carry exclusively a lot of their products. And so I love to go on the internet and create videos of me smoking out of their pieces. And people are always like, Oh my gosh, Ada's smoking on the internet. And it's like, one, it's CBD. Two, who cares? It's whatever. Like, why can we not be smoking? Smoking is a way to get around. It's a way to get it. It's a way to fast way to experience CBD to, or cannabis. To go, to go on more tangents here and just that, again, it's the Austin connection. It's the fact that you're a podcast host and everything you're talking about. There's like, if this was a conversation and it wasn't on the internet, I'd be interrupting you every five seconds to change topics. But the Grav dugout to me, and I owe them a video on this, is the best smoking accessory that I've ever come across because it's so, so convenient, good. so easy to use. And I, I, I discovered a dugout, I think like 2009, 2010, I used it in the golf course. When I came with, when I found the grab one and just something as simple as the thing on the bottom that clears the it. one hitter, mm -hmm. yep. it is the greatest smoking accessory. So um, I told you, I'm a parent, right? I, it, it, my wife does not consume. She doesn't love the smell of it. So we have that dynamic. So you know, you smoke a joint, you're going to smell like it for an hour or two, right? The fact that I can take this grab thing, it comes in the pouch, go outside. It's a good size bowl for one hit just to kind of yep. get you going. And then you don't smell like it. It's the greatest tool ever. I told Dave that I owe them a video. I told them I would I'd rave about the product, but I you love just did grab it. and the fact that you're there. Well, I got to take it out of my drawer over there and actually do the video. I, sure, sure, sure. But yeah, it's a love fest. It's uh, it's fun though to to be like helping people get into that type of exploration. Though I think that's kind of for me what it always comes back to. It's like I want people to see cannabis as this this accessible plant. Like if you would go, I do. I don't drink a ton of alcohol, but if I do drink, I like drinking tequilas, and so I do enjoy going to tequila tastings. I envision a day where You're someone such a is. Texan such a Texan, someone is able to do, you know, a little cannabis tasting, or we even offer, um, we just launched this. I'm going to mention it because it's a fun idea. We just launched an edibles tasting like box. And so it's like one of each of our edibles. And it's just for people who are like, Ooh, I'm curious know, how cool. a chocolate's going to feel versus a, a, you know, hard candy versus a piece of taffy. And it's just like, I think getting people comfortable to play around, which is where I geek out. Like I'm totally that person who one plans every vacation to a legal state. I do. I just, I, I know I enjoy myself better when I have access to legal cannabis. That, and that's why all my ski trips have been Colorado. Colorado. <laughs> it's my second home. I love Denver. I'm going in a couple of weeks actually. And, and it is just, it's like that constant pursuit of like, I know that I don't know enough about the plant. And the only way I'm going to know more is by putting myself in a position of, you know, experiencing it, trying different ways, trying different ratios. And I know that that's a that can be an intimidating thing for people who might be listening like, whoa, I don't know what like 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams is going to do to me of, of CBD or THC. But I do think that 
I just want people to see this plant for its full glory. I mean, to not but kind of get into the horrible history of the plant. I mean, it's really crazy when you step back and you realize like why hemp is, was outlawed for so many years, oh, yeah. why marijuana has been demonized, why it's even called marijuana, you know, and kind of all those different aspects of the plant. And it's just like, wait, how did we get here? Why is this so bad? Like this, this is a plant, it's a plant. Nobody's adding no. anything to it. It's just like, wow, we really need to just get more people comfortable. And I, I'm just like, I'm on a mission to normalize it. Well, you're doing a great job with that mission between the CBD store and everything else. And then, you know, it's crazy to me. So you have the podcast too. So I want to get into that because your podcast, like I said, is awesome. It's Thank got you. a great production value to it. It's not just a random shit show like this one is, but you know, this is fun too. Um, what made you, because I, when I started my podcast, I had no, I had no job. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do and I wanted to stay in the cannabis industry. So I figured, how do I do that? Well, I was part of a group called Cannabis Lab uh, or we're an industry association down here in Florida. And I talked to Robert. I'm like, you ever think of doing a podcast? We've got a lot of great individuals in our group. We can just start in here and get our guests. And then when the pandemic hit, we started getting a national thing. But I literally, I had nothing else going on. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to start with a camera and a microphone and get this going. You are very busy. <laughs> and this is a lot of work. It, people think that this time right. that you and I are spending on the camera is this is what we do. We come on, we talk to each other, right. we have a good day. No, there's editing, there's notes, there's research involved, there's marketing. Like, yes, I've done a lot of episodes that live in a vacuum because I didn't market them properly, right? It took me a very, very long time just to get our YouTube page up over 100 freaking viewers or subscribers so I can customize the URL. Like, so you have a store, you have jobs you are very busy what did you hit your was it the accident that made you want to do a podcast you just you know it, you hit your head and <laughs> i'm joking but the coolest thing i think about your podcast is it's not just a marketing tool for your store you're talking about marketing tactics and everything else and i love that so what made you want to start doing this crazy job that we do I mean, you said so many things. I'm like, yes, I feel it. Like all the pains, all the excitement. I'm like, I'm a crazy person. Why did I do this? Um, I guess it's one of those things I feel like, you know, right now to kind of give a brief contrast, I have a friend who's writing a book and I'm like, oh yeah, I could write a book. Like I could say some stuff, but like not for me. And so I think there was a lot of that. Like I am busy. Like the reality is like, it's really difficult. Like you said, it's not just sitting down and recording a podcast. It's how am I going to market this? Who are my guests? How am I going to carry this conversation? What am I trying to ultimately, you know, do with this show? Um, to be honest, I love creating content. I think that there is an aspect of like that, that to me isn't work. And if you are, have ever paid attention to Gary Vaynerchuk, um, I said, mm -hmm. I think before we were recording, he's very much an advocate for like, don't let, you know, great be the enemy of good. And so just this constant put shit out there, put it out there. I mean, I appreciate the sentiment of the show being very high production value to give a little bit of BTS behind the scenes. Um, I produced probably the first four or five episodes on my own. And then I got, I got very overwhelmed. I'm going to be honest. I do not like editing to, to even do show notes was very exhausting for me. And so I actually found a podcast producer who I pay a fee per every episode that they go in and edit it. And I love it because it really allows me to do what I'm best at. And that's telling stories and creating the content. So I still do market my own shows. Um, I do a lot of the work, you know, pre and post it's just the editing part that I'm not really doing. And, and that was a piece for me that did allow me to be able to continue doing the show. But uh, why I started it selfishly, I love cannabis and I love marketing. And I wanted to have those conversations because I really believe that, you know, I started looking at the industry and realizing that, I, you know, like who's the expert who, who has come before me and has done it better. And when you are realizing that, there are brands. I mean, the industry isn't like just born yesterday. You know, there's definitely people who've been in it, especially in Colorado, California, where it's been a couple of years from the legal weed side of the house. But when you're getting into CBD, the, the nuances are so varying. You know, it's, it's federally legal, but I can't advertise on Instagram or Facebook. Yeah. You know, it's federally legal, but it's hard for me to be operating an e-commerce store as well as a retail and finding a solution that integrates. And so I just think there's a lot of stuff that I've personally had to go through that I was like, 
I want to be a resource for people because I do believe a rising tide lifts all boats. I believe if I can help somebody else navigate this a little bit better, then I'm contributing to the overall success of this industry. And I really do want it to thrive. Um, I, I personally just love the hell out of the plant. It's given me a lot of my life back and it's given me a lot of purpose. And, and that just to me is like such a sweet spot to exist in. So there's a very like altruistic, like I just wanted to have conversations. And then I think the punchline too was, I got broken up with kind of at the beginning of COVID with somebody that I was very in love with. And I haven't actually really even admitted that to being the reason, but I appreciate the candor and the transparency we're having with this conversation. And yeah, I, I was broken up with, so it wasn't like I was, you know, in between jobs with that kind of feeling, but I think it's almost a similar feeling where you're just like, Ugh, like nothing is going my way. And I feel very like voided and like, what should I be doing? And I need to do something that inspires me and makes me feel creative. And so I definitely didn't have big dreams for it. It was just like, I just want to start having conversations. And so I did, I'm not quite, um, cause I just launched the beginning of COVID or the middle of COVID. I should say, I've, I've only published 17 episodes, so I'm not as tenured as you with 80 episodes. I look forward to that day, but it, it's not smart. I, I was doing <laughs> at one point, uh, I look back in the weeks. I think at one point, there was a week where I might have done eight episodes where we recorded four of them and I did four live. And it was fun. But at the end of that week, I was just like, I felt like I ran a marathon. I'm just like, oh my God, that was crazy. I 100% relate to that because I think when I first launched, it was very like the excitement. I was editing. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm getting these guests. And I mean for people again, to probably look at my show too and think like, wow, this person's like really put together. I promise I'm not, I'm really scrappy. I don't think that you have to have a lot of money. I don't think you have to have a lot of resources. I think you have to have, you know, yourself, your creativity, and just like put some shit out there. And so half of my guests have been like me going through LinkedIn and just cold emailing people. Yeah. Some of my guests have been me sliding into people's DMS on Instagram. I watched this one virtual cannabis conference and they had trade show booths, virtual. You talking and about they a merge? Had, I did tune into a merge. It wasn't a merge. It was okay. MJ Unpacked, I think. Okay. And I, I literally went to these trade show booths and they had contact emails and I would go, hi, I'm so-and-so. I launched a cannabis and marketing podcast. Would your chief marketing officer or head of brand like to talk to me? I ended up getting an interview with Ricardo Baca. He is the first editor That's of awesome. a cannabis section of a national newspaper. So he was the Denver Post editor in chief when Denver, uh, when Colorado went wreck. And so yeah. just little things like that were like, I wasn't like, I'm going to create this show and it's going to do all these things. It was like, I just want to talk to really cool people and tell really cool stories in my industry and selfishly learn as much as I can so that I can go champion this plant. And, and so it's all very just like fortunate. It's all just kind of like rolled out and together. And so it's, it's like on one end, I don't want to say it's easy. It doesn't take work, but on the other side, it should be fun and you should be enjoying what you're doing. And so again, obviously I'm just very passionate about the plant that it's been very fueling for me to want to go have these conversations. But, oh, one thing I was going to add, you said all these episodes doing so many. I was, when I first started, I was like, I'm going to interview like four people in one day. And then I realized like, I can't, I can't talk to four people for four hours. I then have to go record the intros and the outros and being creative. And uh, so now I limit it. I only record on certain days. I only do two recordings a week. I'm very like, you know, scheduled and planning now. And I'm blessed to be able to do that. But yeah, I mean, some people want to publish multiple episodes multiple times a week mine's once a week. It's just, what's your cadence and what feels easy and comfortable for you? Yeah, we, um, so when we started, we started end of January before this, and I was doing these in person and I was, you know, driving to people's offices in Florida. And they're always like, where do you record? When do you record? And I was just so excited to get guests. I'm like, wherever the hell you are and I'll work around your schedule. I'll just show up. And so much that I actually, when I got, so my first podcast that I did, I did it with the founder of C-Lab and then a gentleman by the name of Charles Felix, he runs Cannabis News Florida because Charles had all the equipment and he brought the microphones and the lighting and everything else. And I looked at that and he came with this huge like flatbed of stuff. And I'm like, I, I can't do that. I need everything that I want to fit in a backpack. And I went and I bought a bunch of stuff and returned it until I found everything that fit in a backpack. And we did them in person. And then, like you said, I went to a conference. It was the Benzinga Capital Conference down here mm. in Florida. And I, we had a booth and I would just people get off the panel like, Hey, we want to, I have a podcast. Can you come to the booth and record it? 
We did like so four cool. or five episodes at Benzinga. And then I went up to the NCIA in Boston and I cold call a bunch of people ahead of that. Like, hey, I'm going to be there. And it's so funny. I went the hotel where the conference was. I went to the front desk and I go, hey, I know I booked a normal room, but I do this podcast. I don't really have a place to record it here. If there's any way that you can give me a room that's a little bit bigger so I can record the podcast, I'll shout out the hotel, whatever you want. They gave me a suite to record the podcast. I'm like, okay, I'm doing something right here. So we, we recorded probably another four more. And then when COVID hit, my day job had kind of, cause I, I have a day job. This is a side gig for me, right? I'm a technology consultant. I'm actually moving to another company in the industry. I don't know if I can announce it yet, but I'm really excited about it. And um, yeah, so my day job slowed down and I just put the gas on this and we started doing four episodes a week, five episodes a week. We were getting guests left and right. And now finally I got to a place where we had all these guests when we were going so hard. I think it was like two weeks ago where I'm like, well, we don't have any guests out there this September. I'm like, wait a second. I've been focused so much on everything else. So now I finally got back to a place where I'm like, all right, we're gonna do one live a week. We'll do one recorded a week. We're gonna focus on marketing and everything else. It's funny, you kind of buy into that when you start doing this because this time on camera that you and I are talking, this is the fun part. This is so much fun. And it's like, I realize all that other stuff. It's like, hey, Todd, you have to do all that other work in order to enjoy the fun part. And it's worth it to me. So I, I, know, totally I totally relate to your story. And this is so much fun going back. Like you said, you said you could write a book. I tried that. I tried writing articles. I suck. I, I write like I talk and it's all over the place and everything else. And when I took a look at my writing and I'm like, well, people are like, Oh, don't worry. We'll get someone to edit it for you and everything else. I'm like, well, then it's, it's not my words anymore. It could be twisted. And I don't like that. Like, even if you give me final approval, like, so I just started this and it's been so much fun. And like I said, I wouldn't have discovered this podcast has helped me. And I don't know if you feel the same way. Yes. And bring myself into the industry so much more because I get yes. to discover all these cool people like you um, to come on this show. I mean, like I said, what, how did I find you? I listened to your show, found you on LinkedIn, sent you a message, said, hey, loved your episode with Jeremy. Do you want to come on my show? So it's, it's so amazing it's like. Tool. It's literally such an amazing tool. And it's like, I just, again, I'm such a big Gary Vaynerchuk fan. I think um, I'm really into like personality tests and I'm very self-aware. And I just think my personality type is a little bit more of like a go-getter. Like I'm an achiever, Enneagram three to if that means anything to anybody listening. And so I might be a little bit more erratic to go (laughs) do these, these tasks to get myself there. But I do think that it's like anything is possible. Um, it really just takes being in action and figuring out what works for, you know, you and your lifestyle best. And I, I relate to it like you too. It's just been such a blessing to me because I care so much about the industry. It's like, I want to know as much about the industry as possible. And so being able to have conversations with people. It is a benefit to myself too, ultimately of, Hey, like I had an interview with somebody the other, the other day from Arkansas. I have no idea what's going on in Arkansas. Interviewed somebody from North Carolina, have no idea what's going on in North Carolina. Now I do. And now I have people who can be resources. And I think again, when you kind of reflect back on the, the timeline of where we are sitting presently with cannabis in America today, Oh, we're just scratching the surface. There's so much to be uncovered, learned, discovered, and it's just really exciting. And so I always joke, um, joke is probably not the right word. I always say it's the one-to-one. Like, I don't care if, if just one person listens to our conversation. Like, I don't know how many people are on live on Facebook right now. If it's zero or one, great. Like, I don't care. Um, were you going to tell me? You, you waiting for the number? It, it, I thought it's you were going to tell me. We got Hi, oh my lives. gosh. I love that. I just think it's whether you're talking to 12 people or 1200 people, like what a privilege to be able to have a voice and to tell a story. And so I hope people listening can see through our conversation, through your podcast, through my content, like what makes sense for them? You know, I think people look at what maybe we do respectively and it's like, oh, that's so cool. How do I do that? I'm like, I'm not a superhero. You can do it. You just have to start. it's funny. The reason I like doing these lives is because the lit, like we have 12 people watching now, but I guarantee by five o'clock today, it's going to be up over 500 views, which is why I love doing it this way. Right. It's just, especially considering we didn't market it, that we were going live and 12 people just found us, decided to stop and watch. Right. Um, let me ask. So it's funny. I do these podcasts and like, you have such a good conversation at the end of it. You said, you're like, now you have a resource in that state that you can go to like the interview ends. And then it's just me and the other person still on the zoom call. And I'm just sitting there like, 
so so are we friends now because it, it feels like we're friends like we're friends. it's such a weird conversation um do you so do you have in the industry do you have a dream guest that you want to get on and have you had them yet is there oh one gosh. interview that you really really want not to pick favorites um, I'm right now I'm really trying to get, I think, so for me, because my, my podcast is around marketing, I think I'm really fascinated with that filter, if that makes sense. So I'm looking mm -hmm. for brands that have done a really good job setting themselves apart in the space. Um, and so I think for me, a brand that I really would like to interview is, is Leafly. I think that they've okay. done a really good job setting themselves up in the industry. Of course, just being a resource, I consume a lot of their content and, and I'm working on manifesting that interview to happen. I think they've uh, said no to me possible. several times. Oh, really? <laughs> Actually, no, let me, let me correct that. They haven't said no to me. They've not responded several times because when I first started this podcast, I would mention the, you know, the terpene profiles that they put yep. up on their website. Yeah, I call I forget what I, I used to call them the kaleidoscopes, right? Mm, and I would mention it all the like time. That. So, you know, I basically like I'm like, Oh, well, I'm just gonna, you know, message them and send them the clip where I talk about their company 10 times. And no, I haven't heard anything back. But oh, it's well, that, that's a great one. I hope you get them. I really do. Thank you. I'm putting the good good vibes out in the universe. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of one of those things like I'll boast on one that I think is really fun that I was able to have. She's one of my first interviews. If you're familiar with Colorado in any capacity, they're the first state to legalize adult use and medicinal. And mm -hmm. I think Colorado for me has always been a close second home. I grew up kind of going there and there's a brand called Love's Oven which I learned has the third like edibles license in the state. And they've still been operating for the past 10 years. And it's owned by this very sweet woman named Peggy. She's the CEO. And I like literally had like, I, to give you a little bit of a timeline too, I went from, I'm going to start a podcast to having the, the name to figuring out, I changed podcasting platforms kind of in the middle, like six episodes in, but like picking okay. a podcast platform and just like launching probably within like three or four days. I was just very fast. I was like, don't, don't think about it. Just do it. And then from there, it was like, well, I need guests now. And so I, of course I'd have a landing page. I was like, Hey, I don't, I don't, I haven't interviewed anybody yet, but like, it'd be really cool. Like if you would let me interview you for this podcast that like, I'm going to start and it's going to be cool. Like if you would just be on my show. And so I was like, yeah, kind of pie in the sky if I could interview anybody. And so I'm thinking, what are brands I like? Where are places? And so I was like, Oh, loves oven, this amazing edibles company. They've been around for a decade. One of the first in the state. And I found the email and it was like info at lovesoven.com. And I'm like, hi, you know, a little tip to people listening, do your research. I think, um, personalizing the email, like figuring out, you know, oh, who yeah. you want to interview, addressing the email to that person, trying to find more content. So I found an article that Peggy had done where she was talking about the brand. I was like, Hey, I read this article. I think Peggy would make a really good fit. I'd love to highlight these types of stories. And I, I sent it to their info at addressing it to Peggy. Peggy responds to me. Peggy goes, Shada, awesome. I'd love to be on your interview. I mean, on your podcast, I'd love to be, you know, uh, interview with you. And like two weeks later, I had her on the show and then had a really great conversation. And then uh, maybe like a month and a half later, I got to fly out to Denver for some business stuff. And I got to go tour Love's Ovens and see where they make these edibles. And for me, it was just such a like, whoa, I did that. I made that happen. I went from like, here's an idea for this podcast. This is a guest I want to have. This is a really cool brand that I grew up eating. Now I, I'm like standing and she, Peggy showed up to give me the tour. It was, it was such a beautiful like That's moment really for me. Cool. Like literally just like those are kinds of things that I just feel so fortunate that I get to do, but it's not like I expect that from the podcast, if that makes sense. It's yeah, like, I'm no, just literally it, like going out there being like, if I could dream as big as possible, what the hell does that dream look like? And it's like, I'm, I'm living it. So yeah, it'd be nice to get Leafly, but man, I'm already interviewing some really cool people that I can't complain. It's so funny the things that come from it because I don't expect any of that either. I'm just like happy as hell when someone agrees to do an interview. And then like, you know, I started talking to all these companies out in California and they're like, when are you coming out here? We mm -hmm. want to show you the tour. We want to do this and that and the other. And I'm like, you guys realize I only get like 5,000 views per episode. Like I'm not Joe Rogan. You're not getting millions of downloads. Like, no, no, we had fun. Let's do this. And it's crazy to me, like to be able to get some of these guests. So like you talk about Gary Vee and I love Gary Vee. I saw him when I used to, I, I worked in the tech world and I was at a Microsoft conference. I saw him when he first started talking 
And then when I just rediscovered him, I didn't like him again. And then he grew on me. And then I'm like, wait, I did like this guy all the way back then. But with Gary to me, I love him. I love his message and everything else. But he's always been on that mission, right? The people yes. that are really interesting to me are the ones who have reinvented themselves. So actually what got me into podcasting, not that you asked, but I wanted to share anyway, um, oh. is there's a comedian named Brendan Schaub. And he was a football player at the University of Colorado. And then he was a UFC heavyweight. And he wanted to get out of fighting and he reinvented himself as a stand-up comedian and a podcaster. And I'm looking, I'm like, you have this guy who was this warrior and all of a sudden, you know, he's making people laugh. He's not beating the shit out of people. He's making people laugh. And I started looking into these people who reinvented themselves. And there was a lot of athletes. Um, there was particularly one, his name was Eben Britton. And I was lucky enough to have him on the show. If you know who Eben is, Eben is Mike Tyson's partner in a lot of his companies. And he's his co-host on Hotboxing, Mike, Mike Tyson's podcast. And he was in the NFL. And I don't mean any disrespect to Eben, but he was a lineman. He wasn't a name. He wasn't like a Ricky Williams or somebody that we've had on the show. You probably know him with the Austin connection, right? Um, and I was able to get Eben on this show and it was absolutely incredible. So like, and now like I have an open line of communication with him. So, you know, I think the, these shows are incredible and it's amazing to me. I don't think in any other industry that you and I would be able to do what we do as easily as we do, but because we're in cannabis, we're super passionate about it. And as a marketer, you know, better than anyone else, there are limited amounts of channels that you can leverage. 100%. So I, I think that gives the ability to folks like you and I to be able to do the things that we love and be successful at it. I don't know if you feel the same way. No, a hundred percent. I think that you just hit it on the head. It's like, Hey, I can't do these activities. I can't be on social media in the full capacity that I'd like to compared to other brands. And so you do, I think have to get creative, but it's also very liberating, I think, too, to be producing a podcast versus another form like you're talking about a book. I relate to what you said too. How do your words get, you know, twisted or placed? And I think a podcast is a little bit more raw. And I think it's very fitting for this industry to have these kind of unfiltered conversations because I think it's very shocking to some people. It's like, oh my gosh, they're talking about cannabis, but yes. Oh my gosh. We're talking about cannabis and you're a dad and I pay taxes. I mean, you also pay taxes, but like we're upstanding citizens. I try not to. I know. I know. But we're law abiding upstanding citizens, you know? And, and why is what we do so difficult to tolerate, to understand, to get access to, to market? Like there's just all these different facets that Again, and I think it's part of my personality type that I, I get off on this stuff. I'm just like, oh, work's going to be difficult today. Like, yay me. Um, I mean, definitely don't love that aspect of it, but I do appreciate the challenge and kind of sitting in a position of nobody's having these conversations. Why aren't we having these yeah. conversations? Like if you can listen to Ad well, Age. We are, but we're having them behind closed doors. For behind the closed part. doors. But you, I look at these huge brands, like another guest I was fortunate to have on the show, which I mentioned just because it's a national brand. People have probably heard of Wana. They're like mm -hmm. the number one edibles company in America. They just made by, a know, deal to come to Florida, actually. They did. I heard about that. And they're also, I think, in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, that's a business. That's a brand. And we're not talking or highlighting that brand as like, you have a marketing team. How do you function? You know, what is your team? How, what are their strategies? Okay. So you can't be on social media in the same capacity that Nike can be on. So like, what do you do? How do you be creative? And oh, by the way, your product sometimes makes people feel very overwhelmed or sick sometimes if they eat too many edibles. Yeah. So it's like so fascinating for me because you, you said it, these conversations happen behind closed doors and it's like so new and and it's just so mysterious that I'm like, we have to peel the curtain back a little bit. It's fun. And I, how do you learn otherwise? So yeah, I totally, yeah. totally relate and just, I eat it up. I think it's, um, I'm constantly learning new stuff, which is it, surprising because people are like, you're the expert. I'm like, you don't even know what I don't know. And I don't know a lot. <laughs> the deeper you go into this industry, the more I think I know, the more, and, and this is just in life, the more I think I know, the more I realize I have no clue, right? I get to a point where, and I, you know, you compare me to my average friends and a lot of my friends consume cannabis. It's, you know, they don't, they know this much and I know that much, but there's this much to know. Exactly. Right? Exactly. It's, it, it's crazy to me. And I always, it's funny. I always try to have these conversations with them and they're like, Oh, I don't, I don't want to talk about this right now. We're out in public and everything else. I'm like, 
you just had nine vodkas and you right. don't want to talk about cannabis. Like, right. Sorry. So but, what did I do? But it takes I people to- like you and I talking about it. Oh, hundred percent. I love having these conversations. And I think, look, I mean, you and I have been talking for over an hour at this point and I can keep going. We can do one of these Joe Rogan, Duncan Trussell, uh, you know, marathon episodes, but I do have another show to do at 1230. Um, good. Listen, this is, this has been awesome. I hope when things get back to normal, I am definitely making it back out to Austin. Maybe we'll go, like I said, taco deli or my f- absolute favorite thing I've ever eaten is in Austin, outside of Austin's at Valentina's, <gasps> the real deal Holyfield breakfast taco is one of the greatest things I've ever had in my entire life. I have dreams about this thing. I can attest to that taco. It's so good. Um, yeah, like you were joking earlier, we are now friends. You have a friend in Austin. Any yes. time you want to come hang out, eat tacos, you're welcome to. And we have got a lot we're of uh, go tw- hemp flour to smoke. <laughs> yes. Yes. Lots, lots of hemp flour and, and tacos. I love, tacos. you know, it's funny. I actually, when I, with taco deli, uh, like five, six years ago, I walked in there. I, I loved it. I had gone there a few times and I went to the owner. I'm like, Hey man, I want to open one of these in Florida. He's like, Oh, we're just focusing on Texas right now. I go, no, no, no. I'm taking your menu. I'm either going to open it with or without you. Like <laughs> I didn't do it, but I wanted to so bad. I would love for taco deli to come to Florida. Austin's the best. Oh, and then uh, Black's Barbecue, their beef rib. I have a beef with them because I literally, I went there once, they were sold out. The second time I went, the person in front of me in line got the last one. So I still need to get there and get that beef rib. Wow. They gave me like the last of the sample piece. And I'm like, oh, this is a tease. It's one bite of one of the greatest pieces of meat I've ever had in my life. Um, you guys, you guys do it right in Austin. Hopefully with Joe Rogan there now, maybe he'll get on the advocacy side with you guys because he wants to be able to smoke his weed. So, yeah, we could definitely get behind Joe Rogan getting behind these Texas laws. So fingers crossed. Absolutely. Well, I hope that all happens. Shada, I will definitely have you back on the show as things change in Texas. You're welcome back here whenever you want. Let's get all your promo stuff out because my dog just broke into my office. Um, so think you might be able to hear my kid cry in just a second, but let's get social media, website, everything else. So you can follow my CBD brand, Restart CBD, pretty much everywhere on the internet, restartcbd.com, Facebook, Restart CBD, Instagram at Restart CBD. And then if you want to follow up with me and my cannabis shenanigans, uh, I'm at the shadatarabi.com, Instagram, pretty much my two places I hang out. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a fun conversation and thanks to everybody listening. And yeah, I genuinely do enjoy connecting with people. So if y'all have questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Well, if you find yourself in, in South Florida, you're welcome to join us and you're welcome to join Cannabis Lab. And we hope to see you down here. And thank you everybody watching at home. Uh, we have the lab report at 1230. So check that out. And then next week, Tuesday at five, facebook.com slash cannabis group. And don't forget next Thursday, we have our panel on cannabis banking. That is going to be at 420 PM on Thursday. It's going to be anchored by Zach Coburn of Ackerman. We've got a lot of great people on that. Tyler Berlin of hyper, uh, Dana Chavez as well. Definitely one you want to check out, go to the website, join clab.com. Uh, use this code clab100 to get in for free. This has been another episode of elevate your grind. And we're out.